for sure. Okay. So once again, welcome everyone to my 7B final review. Let's go ahead and get started. So the first topic that I would like to talk about is fluids, something that we started with way back at the beginning of the quarter. So fluids has two sort of main equations that we are worried about. One of those equations is the Bernoulli's equation. This is an energy density equation. So what this means is that there are several terms. We have a change in pressure. We have a change in potential energy indicated by a change in height from one location to another. We have changes in the kinetic energy of the system, rho delta V squared A to B. And then those equal sort of external parts of the system, things that take energy out, indicated by these resistance terms here, and then things that add energy back in, pump terms like the following. All of these terms are energy densities, which means they all have units of joules per volume, joules per meters cubed. Going through very quickly, rho here is a density, is not the same thing as G. Rho is a density or a mass per volume. All right, the second main equation that we have is the continuity equation. This is simply just saying that all the fluid that comes in must come out. What I mean by that is say we have two inlets and then three outlets, sort of this diagram down here. If we look at that, I have a current one, a current two, a current three, a current four, and a current five. Now, this is the point where I'm gonna ask for a little bit of participation from those of you who are joining me. Based off of what we know from the continuity equation, all the inlets must equal all the outlets. How would we write the continuity equation for this system? What do we know is true based off continuity for this particular problem? Please feel free, you do not have to unmute. You may go ahead and just write into the chat if you have an answer to participate. Also, if I am unclear or you can't hear me, let me know. Yeah, so basically all we're going to do is we're going to say, well, we take all the ends, this counts as I1 and I2, and those just have to be all of our outs, this being I3, I4, and I5. So the continuity equation is a good way to connect multiple fluid systems that we can then use in our Bernoulli's equation. So the main tactics that we're going to use when solving fluid problems is the following. Step one is to determine how many fluid systems we have. So when we start a problem, the first goal is to ask ourselves how many fluid systems are there in a given problem. For instance, the practice problem that we're going to be doing following this is a system like so with a single current in that I'll call I0 and then three out currents, current one, two, and three. How many fluid systems are there in this fluid system or in this system, I should say. How many fluid systems are there? Yeah, it turns out there are four, right? The idea when we're asking how many fluid systems there are is we're asking how many independent currents are there. In this case, there are four independent currents. This means that as far as how many Bernoulli's equations I can write, there are four total Bernoulli's equations I can write one for each of these constant flows 
in the entire system. So once I know how many fluid systems I have, I go to step two, which is write out my Bernoulli's equations. And then finally, step three, solve for unknowns. So this is the general tactic that we're going to be using for trying to solve fluid type problems. Determine how many fluid systems there are. That tells us how many Bernoulli's equations we'll possibly need to solve the problem. And then solve those Bernoulli's equations for unknowns using things like continuity and our Bernoulli's equations. So let's do a practice. So I have this fluid system here. So I'm gonna erase and rewrite. There's my eraser. <laughs> let's see if we can make a problem out of this. So as stated, I have a single inlet and I have three outlets. Each of these has some resistance, R1, R2, and R3. Each of these outlets are exposed to air. So at point B here, we're at one ATM. At point C here, we're at one ATM. And at point D here, we are also at one ATM. There is some total fluid coming in. And three outs, I1, I2, and I3. How do we, so our goal is to determine the resistances in each of these three pipes. I will note there is a change in height from B to C of one meter, and a change in height from C to D of another one meter. How do we start to set up this problem? Using our three steps, what's the first step we need to take? So we've already sort of done this. So we've determined the number of fluid systems. So we know that there are four. So there's four equations I could write. Note, what am I looking for? What are the variables or the things that I need to solve for? What's the, what's the question I'm asking? Resistance, right? I'm looking for these three resistances. So of these four fluid systems, which of those systems actually involve those resistances? For instance, does the main pipe back here have anything to do with these three pipes resistances? Do I need that fluid equation? Well, it turns out the answer is no. I don't necessarily need this fourth equation back here. I do know by continuity that these three currents must add up to this last current here, but all I really care to know is these three systems here, sort of from the start of the pipe out to each of the endpoints here. So let's start writing those equations down. So for pipe one down here, what we have is we have a change in pressure from where to where. How do I start writing down my Bernoulli's equations? Now, I only have these three points marked. What's something else that I can do to try to help solve fluid problems like this? For instance, now that I know there are these three fluid systems, how do I solve back and forth between them? What's something else that I absolutely need in order to relate multiple fluid systems? Right, Heather is right in the comments. We need a common point. So. If this is all you were given on your exam, where would you put the common point? Where's the missing sort of junction that we can use 
to relate all three of these fluid systems together. So it is pressure, but what do we know about the pressure and where do we know something about the pressure? For instance, if it's a common point, it's a place where all three systems share the same pressure, where would current one, current two, and current three share the same pressure? Yeah right before they split. So what we'll do is we'll add another point in here that we'll call A, that at that point, we know all three fluid systems share the same pressure. This will be useful when we go to write down those Bernoulli's equations. So now let's complete doing that. So for pipe one here, we have the pressure from A to point D. What energy systems change in this pipe section here? As we go from point A up here, to point D down here, what energy systems change or are different in this equation? Height, so there is going to be a change in potential energy. So we're adding a rho G H D minus H A. Note, whenever we're doing Bernoulli's equations, how do I know which of these two heights to write first? What's the sign convention for determining whether I am starting with this point or this point and writing differences? This is actually a key idea. Yeah, but what suggests final and initial? How do I know where the final point is and the initial point is? What's the thing that sets all the sign conventions for any of our fluid systems? Right, Katrina is correct. It's the direction that the current is flowing. So in here, since the fluid is flowing towards D, we will start with all the points at D and from it, take away the difference to point A. With that, the only other term that exists here, is there a change in kinetic energy for this type pipe? What do we think? What's the indicator? What would I have to tell you? So there's a no. What would I need to give you? Yeah. If I gave you some areas, that would indicate to you that there's a change in kinetic energy. If I do not indicate that there's a change in area, Will there be a change in kinetic energy, no matter what is happening in that pipe? No, there has to be a change in area. So the area is not mentioned, nor a change in area stated. You are safe to assume there is no change to kinetic energy. This term depends on changes to area. So there's also no pumps visible anywhere in this pipe. So our last piece is just I1, R1, the resistance term, as we are told that there is resistance in each of these three pipes. Okay. For pipe system three, we pretty much get the same thing. Just in this case, we'll go from A to B. So we'll get rho G H B minus H A equals minus I3. R3, and then for system two, the only difference here now from A to C is that there is now no height change. Everything sort of exists at the same height throughout. And so this will just be equal to minus I2 R2. So from here, the next thing that we really wanna do, we have these three Bernoulli's equations. Where should we start? What seems like the easiest place to start a problem like this and what variables then should we start looking for to begin solving out this problem in full?
we are given the height change, so we know the height change. So what do we know about delta H for pipe system one? How do we know, how does height D compare to height, sorry, that should not be, yeah, height A. So this is not a practice question from uh, the finals in the files. These, this is my own phone that I came up with. We will be covering for some of the other topics. Uh, I noticed that none of the uh, final problems actually covered a multiple fluid system problem. So just to give you practice with that, this is the problem that we're doing here. So Taylor, um, if you just joined us, this is my own problem, but this is a fluids practice problem that you might expect on something like a quiz. So once again, starting with one, how do we know, what do we get here for HD minus HA? So we know it's one meter, right? We can see here that the line here for A and D is sort of one meter apart, right? It's important that we know that it's minus one meter. So the idea here is, is the height D is lower than the height A by exactly minus one meter. So minus one is the number we'll plug into here. What about HB minus HA? Now that one's only one. No, in this case, we're going one meter above our sort of zero point here at point A. So this delta H is going to be a positive one meter. Okay, so we definitely know those. What else do we know? For instance, do we know rho in this problem? Not explicitly. What if I tell you that water is the fluid that flows in this pipe? Exactly. So we need to know something about what fluid is flowing in this pipe. If I say it's just water, what do you know is the density for water? This might be something that doesn't exactly appear on your final exam. You should definitely make sure to check your formula sheet at the back to see if any sort of densities are listed or are listed in the problem. So for the density of water, we just have 1,000 kilograms per meters cubed. We know gravity, that's just 10 meters per second squared. Is there anything else that we know? And if not, where do we start to solve them? When do we need to start plugging in numbers? Where do we go next? Well, if I was a student looking at this exam, I have these three equations I need to solve. And notably, one of these equations looks really, really simple compared to all the rest, specifically fluid system number two here. So what would I need to know in order to solve for fluid system two here? I would need to know something about the pressure at A. So Either on the exam, I could give you the pressure at A, but no, what else do we happen to know? Is there anything else from the other two equations that we can substitute in, in order to, so we do know the pressure at C, but there's, yes. So note, since the pressure at A is the same for all three pipes, and the final pressure is the same in all three pipes, all three of our delta P's are exactly the same, which means that we can plug in any one of these delta P's for the other. So let's try that. Let's take equation two, and let's take equation one here and plug it into equation two. To do that, there's a negative one meter over here. When I move that to the other side, it's gonna become positive. And so what I get plugging in for delta P over here, minus I1, R1, plus rho g times one meter is equal to I two R two. Okay, from here, what can I do next? So what are the things that I'm missing here? How can I simplify this problem down? Is there any more information that I would need to know or could be given 
that would help me solve this out. Yeah, it'd be really nice if I knew what these currents were. So as a practice, let's say that the starting current, this current back here, is roughly 0 0.3 meters cubed per second. And we know or are told that our three exit currents are all exactly equal. Now I'm going to enforce that these three currents are all exactly the same. Is there an equation that I know or can use to find what these three currents must be based off the initial starting current. And that's a good question in the chat and we can use continuity. So we'll do that, but first let's answer the question. So why is it that this delta P and this delta P are the same? Well, no, what do we know about, uh, about the pressure at B, C, and D? Well, we know that they're all three, exactly one ATM. So if I look at these different pressures, if I think of pressure at D minus pressure at A versus the pressure at B minus the pressure at A, should these two terms be the same? So if A is the same pressure and D and B are the same pressure, the differences in pressure are also the same. So we'll go ahead and use continuity to solve for this. Continuity says that I0 must be I1 plus I2 plus I3. However, we know that all three of these are equal. So this is just equal to three times any one of them, say I1. And from here, if we know that I0 is three, meters cubed per second is three I1. We now know that I1, which equals I2, which equals I3 is 0 0.1 meters cubed per second. So given that we know both of those now, we can plug into here. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna move some terms around. So I'm gonna take this term and move it to the other side and then divide out by I. And what we get is, so I'll just do this one step at a time, sorry. I1 R1 minus I2 R2 is equal to rho G1 meter. We'll go ahead and move the I out and divide. So R1 minus R2 is rho G times one meter divided by I1. Since I1 and I2 are equal, I can factor them out and then divide. So I have a relationship between R1 and R2 now. Uh, what else can I do then? So I'm kind of stuck here. I now know the difference between these, plug in numbers and find. So I get 1,000 times 10 times one divided by 0 0.1. So that's 1,000, 10,000 divided by one over 10 becomes 100 thousand. And since this is in terms of resistance, we get kilograms, meters to the fourth seconds. So now the difference between R1 and R2, what's next? And now I know something about R1 and R2, where can I next start to look? Well, we haven't talked about R3 yet. So let's see if we can get something between R3 and R2. So R2 is in our equation two and our equation one. Again, noting that both these delta Ps are the same, we'll just plug this into this here and see what happens for our R3. Sorry, I'm mixing up. Plug in two into three. When we do that, we get the following equation. <clears throat> 
So now we have minus I2 R2 is equal Moving this to the other side, note this is a positive one meter. So we move this positive from the other side, it becomes negative. It's minus rho g times one meter minus I3 R3. So from here, we do the same rigmarole. We'll move this to the other side. So we will get R3 minus R2 is equal to minus rho g one meter divided once again by our current I1, which in this case comes out to be exactly the same, except now this time with a negative number, 100,000 kilograms meters to the fourth second. Is there anything else I can do now? Now I have these two equations, sorry, these two equations here and here, is there anything more that I can do? Just with the information given, can I solve these any further? Is there anything more to do here? Yeah, it turns out I can do that, though that doesn't quite get me any, well, it actually does that get me somewhat interesting. So we've already replaced our I values. So those are sort of good to go. That's actually an interesting point that you raise setting R1 minus R2 equal, because these are in fact equal with the sign difference. So if we try that, so this is negative of this, if we turn this around, uh, uh, I'm suspicious. I'm not sure if that entirely works, but no, the only thing we haven't done, we've compared equation two to three, we've acquired, compared equation two to one, what's the only comparison we haven't yet done? Yeah, we haven't compared equations one and three. It turns out if we do that, we have a set of three equations that we can then plug in for two of the resistances to solve for all three. So we'll do this. And in this one, I'll do in a slightly different color. So our last equation, so here we'll compare one and three. I will move both row terms to the other side to set delta P equal to delta P. Well, that gives me on one side, I will get minus I1 R1. This is a negative, so when I add it to the other side, I get plus rho g one meter. And that must be equal to on the other side, since this is a positive one, I'll move that over to get a negative one. Again, I'm setting these two delta p's equal to each other. I'll get minus I three R three, in this case, minus rho g one meter, since I'm taking a positive term over here and moving it to the other side. Doing the same thing as above, I'll go ahead and I'll add this term to the other side and subtract this to the other side. And what I will get is I will get R3 minus R1 is equal to, I'm going to subtract a rho G1 meter. So now I get minus two rho G times one meter divided by our current, which I will just replace with I1. We already know this number again. This is now twice this, which is 200 thousand kilogram meters to the fourth seconds. From here, this just becomes a game of algebra. What we can do is we can replace R2 to the other side of both these equations, plug in for R1 and R3, and solve for R2. This just becomes a game of algebra. I'm going to go ahead and erase this over here since we now have sort of these three equations that we're going to try to solve. And so moving R2 to the other side, what we get for R3 minus R1 is we get 100,000 kilograms meters to the fourth seconds plus R2 minus 
Uh, oops, hold on. I mixed up my R3s. Sorry. So we're going to plug in first for R3, moving R2 to the other side. So we're going to get a negative 100,000 plus R2. So this is R3 in here. Then the other side of that, we'll subtract 100,000 kilograms meters to the fourth seconds plus R2. And that all must be equal to negative 200 kilograms meters to the fourth seconds. So if we add all these up, we get negative 100 minus negative 100 is negative 200 kilogram meters to the fourth seconds plus 2R2 equals negative 200,000 kilogram meters to the fourth seconds. And we discover something interesting. These both cancel from both sides. And what do we find is the resistance of pipe two? It's zero. That's actually pretty nice. So we actually find that pipe two has no resistance according to our calculations here. That means we can cancel it out from here and here. And we in fact find that R1 is this number. And we find that R3 is this number here going through our calculations. So the exact numbers of this problem aren't terribly important, but hopefully the idea of how we solve this problem did come across. So the idea is we're trying to find how many equations we need to write down. From there, trying to find relations between those three equations using our Bernoulli's equations and our continuity equation to relate as many variables together and solve for our unknowns. Any questions on this problem? before we move into our next topic. Okay, hearing none, let's go ahead and let's try our next topic. So for our next topic, we're gonna to talk about circuits. So note, we have not tested you in terms of RC circuits, but we have tested you in terms of just resistance circuits. Oops, did I erase too soon? There's some uh, emotes in the chat. <laughs> no. Oh no. So we're gonna specifically talk about RC circuits. Um, that last problem was a lot. Um, ideally, that is probably as hard. So it usually will be probably easier than that on your actual exam. That's a much harder problem than you would expect, but it at least brings all the pieces together. At least that was the goal of doing that practice. So in terms of RC circuits, what are our equations that we have? What do we know? Well, the big thing is that we know everything to do with RC circuits follows exponential decay. This means the current, this means the voltage, the charge, all of these equations are somehow related to this decaying exponential here with a time constant tau that is equal to the resistance and capacitance of the RC circuit. Using things like the loop rule, we can find how things like the voltage and charge equations are related to this current equation. For instance, if I have a circuit with a resistor, a capacitor, and a battery, what does my loop rule tell me about this circuit? What do I know must be true if I travel a loop around this circuit? This is the battery EMF over here, some capacitor, and some resistor. Yeah, so we know that delta V loop 
must equal zero, right? So I start at some location A, and I travel in the direction of current for my loop. No, I know that this is the direction for current because I know that current travels from the positive end of my battery, the long stick end, to the short stick end, the negative side of my battery. So from here, what we have is delta V loop equals zero equals. Well, as I cross, the first thing I get is an EMF from my battery. The next thing I get is my resistor. So there's some I R. And then the last thing I get is my capacitor, which I will just write as delta V C for now. Now note, depending on whether or not a capacitor is in a circuit with a battery or is in a circuit without a battery, it turns out that our capacitor will behave differently in both cases. For instance, in the case here where we have a battery, how does the capacitor act? Does it act like a battery? Does it source current? Or does it act more like a resistor and take current or take energy out of our system? It acts like a resistor. So in this case here, if it acts like a resistor, what sign do we expect our delta VC to have when there's a battery in our RC circuit? It should be negative. So in this case, we know that this delta VC here is negative. Note, how can we expand delta VC? No, I R I R I our I R term here is secretly just delta VR in disguise. How can we similarly expand delta VC like we did in terms of I R? What does delta VC depend on? Well, as a refresher, it turns out that what it depends on, delta VC, depends on one, whatever the battery voltage could be, at least in terms of sort of the maximum. Sorry, that's not what I meant. Sorry, getting mixed up. What this depends on, yeah, it depends on charge. And then what else? What sort of relates charge and the voltage? There's one special symbol that relates the charge and voltage. How do we get them? It's the capacitance. So it turns out that VC is just Q over C. So what we can do is in our loop rule here, we'll place delta V with minus Q over C. So we have epsilon minus IR minus Q over C equals zero. From this, if we know what I of t looks like, we can use that to find Q, and from Q, find delta V. So plugging in here, I'm going to move I to the other side. So E minus Q over C equals I R, which equals, when I plug in for I, I get I0 e to the minus t over R C. Then since I'm looking for Q, I'll move E to the other side, multiply by C. So I get minus Q over C equals minus E plus I zero E T over R C. Then I'll just multiply everything by a negative C to get Q equals epsilon C plus C I zero E to the T over R C. Then, oops, there should be a negative sign here. Then I know that these two terms end up being equal. We can find this by plugging in for I0 in terms of epsilon and R and kind of doing some manipulations there. And what we end up with is that Q ends up being this epsilon, the battery EMF times the capacitance, one minus E to the T over RC. No, these are equations that you're more, more than likely going to have on your quiz. 
but being able to do this loop pool is really important and it gives us really good access to sort of being able to draw graphs or other useful information when we have one graph versus another. As an example, say I have the following graph. Here is my charge as a function of time. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to start at some Q max. I'm going to decay down. And I'm going to give that there is a half life. So when I reach Q max over two, that happens in half a second. If that's the case, how would I draw the voltage graph for this capacitor? One, what type of capacitor is this? What type of capacitive circuit? And what? does the voltage as a function of time look like? What do we think? How can we determine? Well, note, our charge and our delta VC are related, right? How are they related? What do we know about the voltage across the capacitor compared to the charge over time? How are they related? No, I mean, they're just related by a constant here, right? So if the Q has this shape, by the way, this is a discharging capacitor, right? We start at some Q max and discharge down to a zero charge. What should the voltage then look like? If the voltage depends on Q, when I'm at Q max, what should my voltage be at the time I'm at the maximum charge? If Q is max, what is delta VC? No, is the charge zero right now? If I look at the start here, no, so, so we're starting at some maximum charge. So what should I start my delta VC graph with? Yeah, we'll start with some maximum charge or some maximum delta VC. Then once I hit zero out over here, then what should my delta VC be once my charge reaches zero? Right, then I reach zero. So note the delta VC graph and the Q graph always look the same. They always look like each other. Whatever the Q graph does, the delta VC graph also does. Okay, so what's an example problem that we can do that you might expect on your quiz? Well, because on the quiz, we're gonna be trying to test sort of your resistor circuit knowledge and your RC circuit knowledge. What you might expect is a problem like this. I have a battery attached to a capacitor attached to a set of resistors as follows. It is a 10 volt battery. I have some unknown resistors and a capacitor up here. What I know is that when I turn this circuit on, I start with a maximum current equal to 0 0.25 amps that decays down to zero and has a half-life equal to 0 0.01 seconds. Given this information, 
can we determine the unknown R and C values for this circuit? So where should we start? Note, this circuit doesn't quite look like our classic charging RC circuit. Is there a way that we can alter this graph here to make it look like our starting RC circuit? Bingo, find our total or the equivalent resistance. Find a circuit that has a single R equivalent that we can then use in terms of this circuit over here, whose equation we know very, very well. So how do I find the equivalent resistance for these three resistors here? No, we don't know what this R is, but we know that this resistor is R, this resistor is R, and this resistor here is 2R. Well, to find R total, we need to start looking for series and parallel pairs of resistors. Are any of these resistors in series or parallel with one another? Yeah, I sure hope so. Otherwise, this is a really hard problem to solve. What do we have? Do we have a series or a parallel pair? And how can we tell? <laughs> yeah. So it turns out that these two resistors here are in series. So remember the definition of two resistors being in series is whatever current goes through the first resistor must be the current that goes to the second resistor. I.e., if there's a single junction here, whatever current comes in must come out. These two resistors must be in series because there's no way the current in this first resistor is different than the current in the second resistor. What about in parallel, right? It looks like these resistors could be in parallel, but what has to be true for resistors in parallel? Does anybody remember what variable, what physical thing must be the same for two resistors to be in parallel? Voltage. So in order for the voltages to be the same, Ideally, two things in parallel form a closed loop with one another, such that the change in voltage across one resistor equals the change in voltage across the other. So if two components form a closed loop together, their voltages are equal and opposite. If we look at this, do we have just two resistors that form a closed loop with one another? Well, no, there's a third wheel here, right? So it turns out we do not have any parallel resistors yet, but we do have a pair of series. To add these in series, our R12, I will call it, we'll just add these two resistors together to get 3R. Now, if I redraw this circuit, capacitor, now I have my R over here, and over here, another resistor of size 3R. Now, do I have a set of parallel or series resistors that I can simplify one more time? Yeah, here I have a closed loop formed by two resistors. There is a single loop rule I can write in here that says that this voltage and this voltage must cancel. So they are the same voltage. And so I can add these two resistors now in parallel. To add resistors in parallel, my R123 or my R equivalent is equal to one over our first resistor plus one over our second resistor to the minus one. To add fractions, I'll multiply by three over three. We must have a common denominator to add like fractions. 
So this gives me 3 over 3r, three, 3 over 3, plus 1 over 3r, the minus 1 is equal to 4 over 3r. So our r equivalent becomes 3r over 4. So coming back over here, we now have an equivalent circuit with one battery, one capacitor, and one equivalent resistor whose resistance is 3R over four, and the battery EMF of 10 volts. So we've done the first part. What's next? How do we now use information maybe from this graph to start figuring out what values we can plug in for R and C? Well, we have a half-life and we have a maximum current. So both of those things are probably useful in some way. Let's see how. Let's first start with this half-life. What could the half-life be related to that tells me something about resistance and capacitance? Any ideas anyone remember? Is there a relationship between this time and some other time that we maybe know or could solve for. Not quite. So no, we don't know anything about the charge, not in particular. However, what we do know is that tau, our time constant, and our half-life are related to one another. In particular, we know that tau is the half-life with what? So when I look at these two numbers, there is a factor of natural log of two between the two of them. Just as an off question, which of these two times is bigger? Is tau a bigger number or is t one half a bigger number? Tau is a bigger number. It turns out natural log of two is less than one. So the relationship between these two values comes in this form. Something divided by something less than one gives me something bigger than T one half. So we actually know that tau is related to our half-life via this formula here. We also then can use the fact that tau is RC to find that RC must be equal to our half-life of 0 0.01 seconds divided by natural log of two. Plugging that in all together, what we get 0 0.01 divided by natural log of two is 0 0.0144, approximately seconds. So that is equal to R times C, but that's still two variables here. Also, as a quick question, this is our, sorry, that's not a question, as a note, this is also our R equivalent over here. So we can also plug in our three fourths. So this is equal to three RC over four, as this is the total resistance of our circuit. So if we're trying to find the missing R here, this is how we would do so. Okay. But we're still not quite all the way there. So we've used the half-life, and this is as far as it got us. What about I max? What is I max related to? Or as a different question, when is the current its maximum? And what does that imply about the voltages in our circuit? Are they equal to 0 0.25 amps? So that's true that the I max is 0 0.25 amps, but that doesn't tell me anything about R or C in particular. How can I take this amperage here and relate it to something about R and C? Which of those two variables should it be related to? 
So what type of circuit have I drawn here? Is this a charging or discharging capacitor? So C is related to our voltage of our capacitor, which definitely actually doesn't have anything to do with our R. This is a charging capacitor, however. So when the current is max, what do we know about the charge on our capacitor at T equals zero if we are charging up? What's the starting charge if we're trying to get to max charge? The starting charge is zero. So we have Q equals zero. So what does that tell us about delta VC? If the voltage across our capacitor is Q over C, what is the voltage across this capacitor at time zero? Well, if we think of it this way, what is the battery doing to this capacitor? Right. In terms of how we know if this is a charging or discharging capacitor, who here, which of these three components is the source for current? Yeah, the battery is the source. So the battery is going to be taking charge. And it's going to start shoving it onto this capacitor. Hence, this is a charging capacitor. If there's a battery involved, the capacitor is charging up. And usually we assume that we always start at a zero charge when we are charging up our capacitor. So if we start at zero charge, that means that we have a zero voltage across the capacitor, but my loop rule must still be obeyed. So what does that mean for the voltage across this resistor? If this has no voltage, but there's a battery over here, what about this resistor? Yeah, we know that the resistor voltage must be equal to the battery voltage, AKA we just have Ohm's law. which tells me that the battery EMF is related to minus I times R equivalent. What I in this case, when we are at charge equals zero, what current are we at? Well, as I sort of hinted here, we're at I max. So it turns out that this max current I max is exactly equal to the battery EMF divided by our R equivalent. So if we have that, we now know that 0 0.25 amps is equal to the battery EMF of 10 volts divided by our R equivalent, which we know is 3R over 4, so 3R over 4. So moving things around, we find that our missing R value is actually solvable by 10 volts times four, a thing over a thing, the four comes up to the numerator, divided by three, and then divided again by 0 0.25 amps. Plugging this into our calculator gives us, we have 10, times four divided by three times 0 0.25 gives us 160 over three or 53.3, 53.3 ohms. So each of our individual R values up here turns out was 53.3 ohms. We can then plug that into over here to find our capacitance. So our capacitance, then becomes 0 0.0144 seconds times four divided by three 
times our R value of 53.3 ohms, which plugging that into our calculator gives us the following, 0 0.0144 times four divided by three times 53.3 .3. turns out is 0 0.36 and that is microfarads. Okay, so I'm gonna take a moment and pause here for a second. So there are two key things. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm gonna go through is the Ohm's law. There's a few key things that we wanna keep in mind. Here. So first off is that remembering how to do our equivalent. It is almost guaranteed that on your quiz, you'll be expected to do some kind of equivalency for a set of resistors in an RC circuit. It'll probably be something simple like this, since you don't have a whole lot of time to dedicate just to this process. The other thing that I want to note is the following. Whenever we are thinking about voltage or maximums and minimums, what's the thing in our circuit that sets how big, how much energy is allowed in the circuit? What's the one main factor that tells me how much charge I can put on my capacitor and how much current I'm gonna run through my circuit? Who controls both those things? The battery. So the battery is related to both how much current and how much charge I put on my two components. Now, which of my components cares about the current? Does the capacitor care about the current or does the resistor care about the current? In which case does one get energy from one or the other? The resistor. So we know via Ohm's law that if I have some delta VR, that is always going to be some current times resistance. Well, if I want to know what the maximum current through a resistor is, well, that is set by the battery, i.e. we always know that the battery EMF is equal to I max R. In other words, if I just take the magnitudes, I know that the battery tells me what the maximum current is via Ohm's law. Similarly, the other thing that I absolutely know, in terms of charge, which of our two components, the R or the C, care about the charge? The capacitor. Note, we know that delta VC is equal, at least in magnitude, to Q over C. And so if I want to figure out what the maximum charge is, Q max over C, who sets the maximum charge? Who decides how big Q max can be? The battery. Therefore, the EMF is always equal to Q max divided by C. These two relationships here are always true. So whenever you see a graph like this that has an I max or a graph that has a Q max on it, those values are related to either the resistance for IMAX or the capacitance for QMAX and the battery EMF. In other words, IMAX is always the battery EMF divided by your total or equivalent resistance. And QMAX is always going to be your battery EMF times the capacitance of your capacitor. Any questions on this? For the most part, we are not going to really test you on drawing up the exponential equations or trying to interpret them. More than likely what will happen is you'll be given a graph and a circuit and asked to do a problem very similar, if not exactly like the one here. Any questions on what I've done here? or the relationships that we've covered.
Yeah. So if we're trying to determine whether or not a set of resistors are in parallel or in series, this is what we're trying to do. So if something is in series, they must share the same current. So the only way that is true or that can be guaranteed is if I have a resistor R1, how can I guarantee that another resistor R2 has the exact same current as this first resistor here? What guarantees that? So I know this is not quite the parallel part, but I think it's important to identify this and then go into here. Yeah, continuity. So continuity demands that if I want this current to be the same as this current over here, there could only be a single junction and one branch in that case. So if I have another outlet, say R3 down here, can R1 and R2 be in series if there's more than two branches to a given outlet or to a junction between those two resistors? No. Continuity says that now current can flow two ways. The idea here is there's a single road between R1 and R2. Any electrons that drive through R1 must drive through R2. They are then in series. Well, what about in parallel? So for parallel, they must have the same voltage drop between the two resistors. So if I have a battery here and I have a set of resistors, R1 and R2, how can I guarantee that R1 and R2 have the same voltage drop across them? If they make a closed loop, so if we look at these two resistors and I form a nice closed loop with both of them, note, I can write two loop rules. One loop rule goes through my battery and R1. What does that loop rule look like? This is called this loop one. What does our first loop rule look like? What two components make up that loop rule? Well, it's the battery and R1. Uh, sorry to spoil the secret. Uh -huh. So it becomes the EMF minus delta V R1. Well, this tells me that delta V R1 is the battery EMF. Well, I can also do a second loop, but this time I'll take the path that goes through R2. We'll call this loop two. That loop rule looks pretty much identical, except this time we use delta V R2. Now delta V R2 and delta V R1 are both equal to the battery EMF. So what we've learned or what we can see is that if we have two resistors and they form a nice closed loop with one another, if this and this form a loop, what does the loop rule say now between these two, delta V1 and delta V2? What must be true if I do the loop rule between those two resistors? Well, zero equals some delta V1 and some plus delta V2. Independent of whatever their signs are, they must be equal and opposite they share the same delta V. Now, if I add in another resistor in here, say there's a third resistor in this closed loop, I no longer have that relationship. Now there's this pesky third wheel hanging around 
that can compensate. So it doesn't, I don't know if any three of these voltages are exactly the same. The only way to guarantee that any two resistors share the exact same delta V is they must be a single pair in a single closed loop. That's the only way to guarantee that they share a voltage and therefore are in parallel. Just because two resistors are next to each other does not mean they are in parallel. For instance, if I look at this battery and these resistors here like so, are R1 and R2 in parallel? Do these resistors form a parallel pair? No, so it doesn't matter that they're right next to each other. They look parallel, yes. But if I actually look at these, what my loop rule says is that these two resistors form a loop with the battery. They do not form a closed loop by themselves. Because of that, they are not in parallel. In fact, what they actually are is they are in series. They share a single junction with no other roads off it. So the current in is the current out. So what we're looking for is we're always looking for pairs that either form a closed loop or pairs that share a single road from one to the other. Does that help? Does that make sense? Perfect. Any other questions? This is probably one of the harder topics. Because of that, we're probably going to ask you much simpler questions that more directly probe your knowledge. We're really looking for these relationships here that I handedly erased. You are absolutely welcome for that. Given that we know things about delta PR and delta BC and then looking for our equivalent over here. Yes, these two resistors are in series. That is 100% correct. Sure, I can go through the different graphs. So for the most part, you don't need to memorize all the graphs. There's only a few that you do need to memorize. One is the current graph. No, what does the current as a function of time always look like? There's only one, no matter if it's charging or discharging, there's only one current graph that exists. How does the current decay? What do we, what do we know about it? We know that it's exponential decay. So we know it's always going to decay to zero and decay from what? What's the starting value for the current always? I max. We will always start at some maximum current always and from that value decay down to T. This is true for charging, discharging. This is always the case. Now, where it starts to get trickier is for things like the charge graph. Well, the charge graph shouldn't be that much more uh, um, complicated. So in this case, we'll do a charging column and a discharging column. So if we're charging up, how should the charge as a function of time look? If we are charging up our capacitor, where should we start and where should we end in terms of our charge? Yeah, we should start at zero and then we're going to charge to Q max. So on here, I will put Q max, we'll start at zero and what shape do I draw between them? Right, it's something that is what we call concave down. 
the idea is that it should asymptote, right? It should approach but never reach its final max value. Just like here, the final value, the equilibrium value, it approaches but never quite reaches in the current. So no, this is what we call decay up. to its max value. The charge decays up to a max value. How about in the discharging case? How does the Q of T look in the discharging? Yeah, I mean, it's basically the same thing, but now in this case, since we're discharging, we will now start at Q max and decay down to no charge left. We are discharging our capacitor. So in this case, we will discharge down and note we look exactly like the current graph, but now with our charge graph. Okay, so the only thing that's left now is our voltage graphs. And technically here now, there are two different graphs that I can draw. There's the capacitor's voltage, but there's also the resistor's voltage that I can draw as well. Now, in terms of these graphs, if I look at the voltage of the resistor, which of these variables does the resistor care about? The current. So no, since the current is the same in both charging and discharging, the delta VR is going to be the same no matter if we're charging or discharging. Notably, we know delta VR as defined is always a negative IR. So if the current graph looks like this, what does the negative of the current graph look like? Well, it just looks like the current graph, but upside down. This is delta VR of T. It looks exactly the same then in the discharging case. It's going to start at some negative max value and decay up to zero. Okay. Well, what about then the capacitor? What does the voltage of the capacitor depend on? If I was to write a equation for delta VC, what does it depend on? Yeah, it depends on Q over C. No, there's a trick here though when determining the sign. No, what sign does the charge always have? What sign does the charge have? What sign do we give it? Positive. Now you might ask, why is that? Isn't electrons the thing that flows? Well, a different question is, what sign do we give our flow? What sign do we always assume the flow has, no matter what we're doing? we assume it is also positive. Well, if the flow is positive, the thing that is flowing must also always be positive. But no, delta VC is not always positive. It depends whether it acts like a resistor or acts like a battery. In the case of the charging capacitor, which does the capacitor act like? If we are charging up, so there is a battery, a resistor, and a capacitor, does the capacitor take energy or give energy to this circuit? It takes energy, right? It takes energy to put charge on this capacitor and that energy comes from the battery. So in this case, the capacitor acts like a resistance to the flow of charge. 
it takes energy to gather charge on that capacitor. So what that means is that the capacitor's voltage will look like the negative of this Q of T. It'll be starting at zero and charge, but it will be a negative value. For the charging capacitor, delta VC is negative. And so what that looks like is we start at zero, because that's the charge graph, but instead of decaying up, we will decay down to some negative delta VC max. Okay. Well, what about the case for the discharging then? So in that case, I have a resistor and I have a capacitor and there's no battery here. We know that some current will flow where? Where is the current coming from in the discharging capacitor? Yeah, in this case, the capacitor acts like the battery. It's the thing that has some excess charge that it's going to get rid of in the form of current. So in this case, delta VC is now a positive value for the discharging capacitor. And it will look just like Q of T over here. So it will start at some maximum delta VC max and then decay down, decay down to some final value. So really, your goal or the ultimate idea, these are the only three graphs you should need to memorize. Note, what does I of T look like? What does the charging and discharging charge graphs look like? And then the voltages come from our Ohm's law and the definition for delta VC. Those are the equations that then tell us how the voltages behave once we know Q and we know the current. So this is the big idea here. No, you probably won't be given all these graphs or asked to draw them. More than likely, you'll be given one or more of these graphs, probably only two, and asked to use those to solve something about a given circuit. Any questions on this? Are we ready to move on to the next topic? We'll give a couple seconds for, for that. Correct. So discharging circuits will not have batteries. Now, there is a special case where if the capacitor has more charge than a battery can support, the capacitor can discharge into a battery. This is in fact how charging batteries works. But in this class, we will not sort of make that distinction. In 7B, charging circuits have batteries. Discharging circuits do not have batteries. That is a distinction that we will always make in the 7 series course. Good question. Other questions? Once? twice. Okay. So I'm going to put this to a vote. Which would we rather talk about? We want to talk about angular momentum and angular momentum conservation, or we want to talk about force torque and force torque balance. Which of those two topics would you rather cover uh, in today's review session? Those of you who are here. Okay. Okay, so there's definitely a lot more votes for angular. So let's go ahead and go through that. So angular momentum is really no different in terms of how we solve problems compared to things like linear momentum. The only difference is the variables that are involved. So angular momentum the symbol L here is represented by one, an angular velocity. This is the angle traveled over a given time. So for instance, if I make one revolution per 10 seconds, 
This is the same as 360 degrees per 10 seconds, which is the same as two pi radians per 10 seconds. So these are all the types of units that you might expect to see for something that is an angular velocity, a radians per second. Note the SI unit for angular velocity is the radian per second, where a radian is given as pi radians is equal to 180 degrees. This is your unit conversion for converting from angle into radians and so on for revolutions. The last piece is this moment of inertia over here. The moment of inertia comes in two flavors. There are point-like objects in which the moment of inertia, I total, is just the sum of all the moments of inertia of the point-like objects. So if I have a pivot point like so, and I have a set of objects, object one, two, and three, each with their own R vector, R1, R2, and R3, that describe the distance of that point-like object. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Um, hopefully the streaming quality is okay enough. I apologize if it quick. Can you still, can it, people see what I'm doing up on the board or is this totally not working for anybody? Okay, I just wanna double check, make sure I can try to write a little bit bigger to make it a little bit clearer. So let me try that. So we have a pivot point here, and then we have a set of objects, each with their own R vectors. The idea here, is that each of these point-like masses has a moment of inertia that is equal to the mass of that object times its position vector squared. So for these three point-like objects, the total moment of inertia would be the sum of each of their individual moments of inertia given by the mass of that object times its distance from the pivot point squared. The other type is for what we'll call extended objects. These are objects like disks or rods or other things like wheels, in which case those have moments of inertia that will be given in the problem and depend on things like the geometry or size of the object in question. So note, you will only ever need to solve for or calculate moments of inertia if they are for point-like objects. So in terms of momentum conservation for angular momentum, we have the following delta L, which is the final angular momentum minus the initial angular momentum is equal to the net external torque over time. So in order for momentum to be conserved, what must be true? What is our indicator for angular momentum to be conserved? There must be no external torque. Nothing external to the system can be twisting on that system and then if that is true, angular momentum is conserved. The net torque or the sum of the torques is given as zero. So let's go straight into an example. So the example that we have in one of the practice problems, oh, like I said, we do actually do some of the practice final reviews. Let me find the right one here. That's a series of pumps. Where is my pizza problem? Here we go. So this is from practice quiz, I believe it is three, and it is question two. So this is 
practice quiz three, question two. Please correct me if I am incorrect. I could have noted that down wrong, but this is one of the practice problems. So a pizza maker spins a circular disc of dough with radius 12 centimeters in the air at 10 radians per second. So I'm gonna draw a top view of our pizza dough. So we have a disc-like pizza dough. Behold, the disc-like pizza dough that has a radius that is 12 centimeters in length. As it spins in the air, the dough expands to twice its initial radius while keeping a disc shape. So we start spinning. Now, we don't know if it's spinning clockwise or counterclockwise. So let's just assume from this view that we are spinning clockwise in this case with a speed of 10 radians per second. This is our initial view. Our final view, the pizza expands to be twice its original radius. So now we have a 24 centimeter big pizza. And what we're tasked to find is what is the new angular velocity? What's the final angular velocity? So the question we have to ask ourselves first, is angular momentum conserved? If it is, how can we use conservation to then solve this problem? We'll model this by using our momentum charts. So note, you do not need to use momentum charts, but it is a handy way to solve many different types of problems. So is momentum conserved for this object? So I have a guess. So why? No, what is our indicator? Our indicator is net external torque. As this pizza is just flying through the air, is there anything to provide an external torque on this system? Well, no, right? There is no way anything else interacts with this pizza. There might be air resistance, but no, Nothing about it is mentioned in the problem, so that must be safe to ignore. So what we know is that indeed, angular momentum is conserved, i.e. the change in L is zero. There is no external torque. Okay, so that means that L initial and L final must be the same. Based off of my picture over here, what direction? is L initial and L final. How do we determine that? Yeah, we need to use our right hand rule that Jessica points out in the chat as well as Luan. So the way to do that is we're gonna take our R vector, hand at the pivot point, fingers toward R, and then curl in the direction of omega. So in both these cases, the pizza is spinning counterclockwise, which gives us an out of the board angular momentum. In terms of variables, what does the initial angular momentum look like and the final angular momentum look like? If I expand these two terms out in terms, of other variables, how do I expand Li and Lf? How do I expand Li? What is Li in terms of variables? Yeah, it must be the initial omega, and in this case, an initial moment of inertia. 
no, how do I know that there are two different moments of inertia in this problem? What sort of is the key giveaway that I don't only need to think of what the initial angular velocity is, but also what the initial moment of inertia is? Right, note that this extended object has a radius that differs from start to finish, which means that I will also differ from start to finish. The distribution of our mass changes from start to finish. So over here we have omega final, I final. So this up here tells us that omega initial, which we know to be 10 radians per second times I initial must be equal to omega final, I final. Well, what can we do with this? Which of these pieces can we expand and how can we expand them? For instance, can we expand the angular velocity? So that's right in chat. We can expand the moment of inertia, but note, is this moment of inertia MR squared? Will I take this disk and plug in the mass of the disk times the radius of that disk squared? Is that the moment of inertia for this disk? It does turn out to be one half. Why do we know that? Just so we can get it into chat, what makes this object not MR squared? That's the equation we gave you in DL. When do you know to use MR squared for the moment of inertia? When it's a point-like object, note pizza wheels, wedges of cheese, whatever it is, if it's an extended object, if you cannot describe it using a single location, it does not have MR squared as its moment of inertia. Instead, you should look in the problem and see if it tells you what the moment of inertia is. It turns out the moment of inertia for a disk is one half m r squared, where m is the total mass and r is the radius of that disk. Note, in this practice quiz, this equation is not given in the problem. Instead, it's given in the back in the list of equations to be used. So note, Sometimes these moments of inertia can be found at the back of your exam. If you are unsure or don't know what the moment of inertia for some object is, don't be afraid to go looking in the equation sheet on the back to go and find it. That's probably where it is if it's not listed in the problem. So with that being said, we can now expand this. So we have 10 radians per second times now our one half mass of the pizza disc times our initial squared must be equal to our omega final times our one half mass of the disc times our r final square. Well, from both sides of the equals, the half cancels, as well as the mass of the pizza disc, it turns out we do not care exactly what the mass is, only where it is located. From here, we then get 10 radians per second times our 12 centimeters squared. Note, centimeters are not the SI unit. Whenever we're dealing with things in momentum or otherwise, we always want to try to make sure that we are in SI units. So SI units, this should be 0 0.12 meters. And over here, there should be 0 0.24 meters. So here we'll plug in 0 0.12 meters squared is equal to omega final times 0 0.24 meters squared. We then divide this to the other side, 0 0.24 meters squared, and our omega final comes out to be a number I will give right now, 0.24 comes out to be 
radians per second. Okay, so that's part A. So that's using momentum conservation to find something out about this system. Then we have another step. So now that we have our 24 inch pizza that's rotating with this angular speed, that pizza dough is going to fall onto a table and stop rotating. So, now what we have is we have our 24 centimeter pizza, which is rotating counterclockwise with a speed of 2.5 radians per second. This is our initial picture. And then sometime later in the final picture, we have that same pizza, same size, but now it's no longer rotating at all. In this picture, is angular momentum conserved and how can we tell? Well, this one, we can actually just go to the chart and check it out. It's definitely not conserved. So in this scenario, right, if we look at the exact same chart, we have an initial angular momentum that is out of the board, same idea here, and on the pivot and rotate in the direction of omega, we are still out of the board here, but our final angular momentum is a flat zero, which means there must be a change in angular momentum. In what direction is that change in angular momentum? How do I go from an out of the board arrow, right? So to this out of the board arrow, we're going to add an into the board arrow whose magnitude must be given by some external torque times delta T. So this is T external times delta T. So our new equation now becomes the following. We have L final minus L initial is equal to T external delta t. Well, our L final is zero, so we will go ahead and zero that out. And what we are left with is that the negative L initial is equal to t external delta t. Now, the signs here are only telling me that the torque and the angular velocity here are in opposite directions, right? The torque is opposite that of the angular momentum. That's indicated by our directions up here. We already have those directions. What's the last thing we need to solve for? The magnitude. So what we'll do is we'll just turn this equation into a magnitude equation. We will take the absolute values of both sides in order to solve for this external torque. So we'll go ahead and do that. When we do that, this negative sign here disappears. And what we get is whatever the initial angular speed, its magnitude times I initial, we divide that by delta T, and this will give us our external torque. Plugging in, we know that this is our 2.5 radians per second. Our initial moment of inertia is given once again by one half M total R squared. We know that R is 0 0.24 meters squared, or 0 0.24 meters, so we will square that. Now, in part B, we're also given what the mass of our pizza dough is. It turns out that it is 0 0.6 kilograms needed in order to solve for this torque. The other thing that we are given is we're given how long our pizza interacts with the table that acts this torque on our pizza. It tells us that delta T, the time, the period over which this torque is acted on the pizza is half a second, 0 0.5 seconds. So plugging all this information in, we'll get a one half times 0 0.6 kilograms times 0 0.24 meters squared divided 
by 0 0.5 seconds gives us our T external. So it turns out that our torque external, when we plug all those numbers in, is given by the following. 2.5 times 0.5. Actually, I'll just cancel this out. 0.6 times 0.24. comes out as a 0 0.84 approximately. Oh, sorry, 0 .0 0 0.086 approximately. What are the units of our torque? When I report a torque, what units do I report that torque in? Yeah, we report it in Newton meters. Remember, a torque is given by RF. So that is meters and Newtons. Therefore, torque is reported in Newtons times meters. So in the end, this is basically the way that we solve angular momentum type problems. It's basically the same way that we solve linear momentum type problems. One. We start off by asking the question, is momentum conserved, i.e., are there external torques on this system? If no, we have conservation, and we can write a angular momentum conservation equation. All of the initial angular momenta added together must equal our final angular momenta added together, and that is our momentum conservation equation. All the initials equal all the finals. If there is an external torque, if it's not conserved, instead, we'll write the same equation, but now with some external torque and time involved in solving that equation. Beyond that, it's basically the same steps that we use when solving linear momentum type problems. Any questions on this before we get into force and torque next? Any questions in general on angular momentum or moment of inertia, anything like that, before we move on? Okay. So with that, the next piece to this is static, oh. Yes, that is correct, Jessica. Omega, the angular velocity, is always in radians per second. The SI unit for angular velocity is a radian per second. That is the SI unit. So you'll always want to make sure that if you're given something in revolutions per second or in revolutions per minute or in degrees per second, you always want to convert those into radians per second. The SI unit is radians. OK. So let's talk about forces and torque then. Classically, you'll usually get these problems in terms of static equilibrium. So when we're in static equilibrium, what do we know to be true? What are our three major equations that set up static equilibrium? What three equations can we always solve or can we always sort of look to to solve whenever we start with something like static equilibrium? Well, the only thing that we have is indeed the forces are zero and the torque is zero. So we have that the torque is zero. So the sum of all torques must be zero. This can also be written as all the torques that are out of the board must equal all the torques that are into the board. As a general note, something that might help Technically, just like left arrows and right arrows can be considered negative and positive, 
usually torques that are out of the board are considered positive torques and torques into the board are considered negative torques such that if you add torques in and subtract torques out, they equal zero, which then gives us this equation up here. So if you're ever trying to solve this equation where you're summing the torques, torques out of the board come with a negative sign or torques into the board. Sorry, I'm gonna try to be less messy with my board. I am, I am having a fucking trouble. Okay, sorry. Torques out of the board come with a positive sign. Torques into the board come with a negative sign. Okay, the other two equations that we have are force equations. No, forces are vectors, but we don't really wanna deal with them in their vector form. Rather, what we'd like to do is instead deal with them in terms of their components. Basically that the sum of the forces in X and the sum of the forces in Y are both zero. This is what we have for static equilibrium. So let's go ahead and go right into an example problem then. This is another one of the examples from your example problems. So we have a platform held up by two ropes and a wind is blowing. So I have platform, I have rope one, rope two, and I have some F wind acting on this beam. This beam has a mass of three kilograms. So mass beam is three kilograms. And we know that F wind is 10 Newtons pointing to the left. So as long as this wind is blowing in the configuration given, the beam is perfectly still. So why is that statement important? What does perfectly still tell us in terms of our static equilibrium questions? It tells us the torque is equal to zero. Is that all it tell, tells us? Is there anything else that we happen to know? Is it just the torque that's equal to zero? No, it also means that all of our forces, both in X and in Y, are also equal to zero. Perfectly still means static equilibrium, means these three equations are true. So our goal, starting in part A, we want to show that the vertical components of the tension on the left rope and right rope must be equal. So how do we determine this? What's the first thing that we want to do whenever we're trying to solve for static equilibrium or in fact trying to find the forces and torques that act on an object? What's the first thing we should do? We should define a pivot point and from that draw an extended force drop diagram. Find all the forces and then find what forces act torques. So, in this problem, where's the pivot point? Where do we want to put this pivot point? It's not so clear, is it? It's kind of tricky. There's no obvious hinge or pivot to place for this object. But note, the definition of a pivot point is a point about which when everything else is rotating, that point does not. Well, notably, nothing in this problem is rotating, which means we can put the pivot point wherever we want. So before we decide, let's go ahead, let's draw in the forces outside of F wind that are acting on this beam. So what forces other than F wind act on the beam? What do we have? We definitely have gravity. And specifically, we know that gravity exactly acts halfway or in the center of this uniform beam. The other thing we have is the tension in the ropes. 
on both sides. So I'll call this tension left and I'll call this tension right. No, tension is just a special name that we give to a force by the rope on the beam. Tension is just a name for forces by ropes or chains or other things that pull rather than push. So we have these two tensions and we have gravity. So our goal is to determine that the vertical components, i.e. the Y components, which I will draw here in orange, here is TLY, and here is TL or T F T R Y. We are to determine that these two are equivalent. So the tension always pulls away from the object. That is exactly right. So the way that tension works is it is a pull. So rather than the rope pushing onto the object, tension always acts as a pulling force. Tension always pulls away from where it's acting. It takes the object and pulls on it. So tension always acts away from the object. It also always acts along the direction of the rope. So this one's actually a trick because we have two things we want to do. We want to determine TRY and TLY. So where should we start? We have three equations we could start with. What should we start with? Which equation is the simplest that we can use to try to determine these two components? Well, if I look at my forces, there's one, two, three, there's four forces, and that's a lot of terms. Probably terms I don't want to have to deal with and don't need to deal with. So the forces have four terms. What about torque? Well, the depends on where we put our pivot point. So if we look here, where can I put a pivot point to reduce the number of torques I need to solve for in this problem? Where would be an ideal place to put a pivot point such that I have as few torques as possible. So we could put it where the tension acts, but if we do that, you know, what are we no longer getting any information about when we go to solve for torque? Well, if I put it here, I no longer have access to TLY in my torque equation. So that doesn't quite seem like exactly the ideal spot. It turns out we could do that. We could actually put the pivot point at one and the other and sort of solve this equation twice to get the right answer. But it turns out we don't quite need to do that. Instead, which of these forces do I not care about, right? Which of these forces are there, but they don't really, they're not really important to me. They don't matter. Well, one of them is this F wind and the other is gravity. Neither of those forces do I care about. So I want to put a pivot point that gets rid of both of those forces in terms of doing torque. So the best place to put the pivot point, it turns out, is right here at the center of mass. If I put my pivot point right here, Gravity does not act a torque. And the wind, if I extend that wind force through, no, it crosses through my pivot point. It also does not act a torque. So the only two forces now that act torques are my tension right and my tension left, the two forces I actually care about. So from there, what do we need next? We have these two forces. Those are the only two forces that provide torques. How do we find the torques provided by those two tensions? We do have the sum of the torque equals zero. So to do that, we'll write torque in equals torque out. 
But we need to determine what torques are in and what torques are out, right? We need to find which ones are in and out. So let's start. So we know that TL and TR will provide torque. How do I determine the directions for these torques? What do I need to start putting into my extended body diagram to note whether or not they will provide torque? What am I missing? And it's not the angles. I'm missing my position vectors, right? I need to know where are left, are right, where my torques are acting. So from there, I'll use my right hand rule for TR. Note, if I take my hand at the pivot, fingers along R right, and then curl them to point towards TR, that gives me a torque that is out of the board at all of you. So this tells me that my torque on the right is out of the board. On this side, however, if I try to do the same thing, I have to curl my hand this way, which gives me a torque into the board on this side. So this torque, the torque on the left, must be into the board. Note, oftentimes if you can get away with just setting one torque equal to the other, but that is not a habit you should get into. You need to know how to use your right hand rule to find what directions each torque lies in when you have more than two torques. So remember, right hand rule tells me what direction these torques are in. From there, we'll plug them into this equation down here. So my into the board torque is this torque over here. So from there, I will write an R right, F right, and this must be equal to my left torque, the only torque that's out of the board, some R left, F left. In this case, these should be tensions, T left and T right. Now note, when I go to write torques, I have to make a choice. Note the torque is always given by either an R perp F, or is given by R F perp. So once we have this written, we now have to make a choice for each of these forces, whether we use the F perpendicular component or the R perpendicular component. For this problem, how do we determine? For instance, if I look at our left torque over here, how do I pick between R perp and T perp? Which of those perpendiculars should we use? So we have a vote for R perpendicular. Why? Why would we want to use R perpendicular rather than just the R back? In fact, I would argue, right. The idea is we want to look at which of these vectors is simpler, which one has the fewest components and that will be the choice that we keep and the other vector we turn into its perpendicular component. So looking here, the tensions, both the left and right tensions, both have X and Y components. This means that there are vectors only have one component and those are the vectors we want to keep. And instead, we will try to find the perpendicular components for both tension. No, we've actually already done that. No, how is the Y component of the tension compared? What angle does it make with just the right R vector? What angle does this component here make with R? Yeah, 90 degrees. So in fact, without even having to do much, we've actually in just sort of by accident already found those perpendicular components and those components are exactly what we're trying to solve for in this problem. So plugging that in now that we know that our perpendicular component is just these y components, we'll plug in from there. So we just have whatever the right radius is times r t r y must be equal to our r left T left Y component. From here, 
We also happen to know, just by looking at the geometry, what do we know about this position vector and this position vector? How far away are each of the tensions relative to our pivot point? Equal. In fact, they're both exactly half the length of the beam. So if we plug that in, L over 2, TRY must equal L over 2, TLY. Well, the distances cancel, and we solve exactly what we are supposed to, that the right Y component and the left Y component are equal. We now know that those vertical components are exactly equal. OK, so that's part A. Now, how do we then find the full magnitude? How do we find these full tensions? We've solved the torque equation for this pivot point. What do we have left to do? What other equations now can we use now that we've exhausted our torque equation? Well, now we can do our force equation. Notably, since we just solved something interesting about the y components, let's start with our fy equation. So going over here to start that, we know that all the forces in the y direction must sum to zero. So what does that equation look like? What components, what forces do I have that act in the y direction? We have Fg and we have the two tensions. So I'll only write these in terms of their components since the components are the things that are in the y direction. So both of my tensions are positive, so they will be TLY plus TRY. And then our gravity is in the opposite direction, so it will come with a negative sign. Note, we actually know what gravity is. Move it to the other side. That's just the mass of the beam times gravity. What also do we know? What do we know about these two components that we solved using our torque equation? They're equal. So I'll use this relationship and plug in one for the other. Where in this case, I'll take TLY and set it equal to TRY, which tells me now that MG must be equal to twice TRY. From there, I'll plug in the mass of the beam, three kilograms times 10 meters per second squared divided by two is equal to three times 10 is 30 divided by two is 15. So 15 newtons must be TRY, must also be TR, TLY. Okay, I've got two components with one equation. Excellent. What can I do next? What's the next thing that I can do? What's the last equation I have to solve? It's the x equation. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to erase this. Does anyone need this equation? Everyone good over here? Can I erase the torque equation? Going once, twice. Okay, no one is screaming at me, bloody murder. We'll assume that this is okay. So now we'll do our x equation. So for this, once again, we know that the sum of the forces in x must be zero. So here we have our x components, which look something like this. Here is TRx, and up here is TLx. So the only forces that we have in the x direction are the wind, TRx, and TLx. So when we put them together into our equation here, it looks like the following. The only positive vector we have is our TRx. And to that, we'll subtract TLx. And from that, we'll subtract our 10 newtons for our F wind. OK. From here, what we really want is we want to find what these components are. Note, one thing that we do know, this theta L up here is given, theta L 
as 25 degrees. Is there a way knowing the Y component for the left tension that we can find this X component without having to do any more work? Is there a relationship between the Y and X components for this left tension using this angle theta? It's not quite sine. It turns out that it's tangent. No, if we look, TLY is the adjacent to our angle, where our TLX is the opposite, and they form a nice right triangle. So based off of Soka Toa, our Toa tangent opposite and adjacent says that tangent of our theta L must be equal to our opposite being T L X divided by our adjacent, which is T L Y. So we now have this new formula that tells me that T L X is exactly equal to T L Y times tangent of 25 degrees. Well, we know T L Y, that's just our 15 newtons times tangent. 25 degrees, and when we plug all that in, we get doo -doo, times tangent 25, comes out to be roughly seven. I'm just gonna round, it's more like 6.99. We're just gonna round it to approximately seven newtons. Okay, so now we know this and we know TLX, we can solve for TRX. Moving both to the other side, we get TRx is equal to TLx plus 10 newtons equals our seven newtons TLx plus 10 newtons. So our TRx is in fact 17 newtons. So we found all the components. What's our last step? What's the last thing we need to do? So where do we get 15 from? What equation did we solve in order to figure out that the Y components are 15 newtons? So note, what we're doing here is we're using tangent to write a equivalence between the X and Y components. The reason we did that is we solve for all the Y components and we know they both must be 15 newtons. We found that from our Y equation. Using that, we can now use that Y component to find the X component using that tangent relationship. That tangent relationship then tells us that the X component for the left is seven newtons. So we now have our, so, if I look at TR, I know, let me do this in a different color, sorry. So I know that TR is given by, well, TRX is 17 newtons and TRY must be 15 newtons. Note, TLX is to the left, so this is a negative 17 newtons, but has a positive Y component. And I know that TL has both positive X and Y, with its X component being seven newtons. We found that using our tangent equation from down here. So we know that we have a positive seven newtons. And again, from our Y equation, it has a Y component of 15 newtons. Are we done? Is this all we needed to do to solve for these two tensions? Right. Listing the components is not enough. We need to list the magnitude. And really, we also need to find this last angle over here to really fully specify these vectors. So to find the magnitudes, we just need to use Pythagorean theorem. So for TR, the magnitude for the right tension is the square root of our x and y squared. So that's 17 newtons squared plus 15 
Newton squared. This comes out as the right tension being equal to 17 square plus 15 square is 514 root, which is some gross ugly number, is 22.67 newtons is the magnitude for the right. Then for the left, we do the same thing. The left magnitude is equal to our seven newtons squared plus our 15 newtons squared. Doing that out, boop, boop, boop. we get another gross number. We get approximately 16.55. Note, this might be a little bit different than the solution manual, depending upon exactly how they did the rounding, but these answers should be very, very close to what's in the solutions for this practice final problem. Now, the practice final itself only asks for these magnitudes. It does not ask for the other angle, but let's go ahead and solve for this other angle here anyway. What is theta right? If we draw it with respect to this axis up here, how do I find theta left? Or sorry, theta right. We have theta left. How do I find theta right? I obviously do not know my directions. So we'll use tangent inverse, but which component goes where? Is this y over x? It's actually the x component over the y component. Remember, tangent is opposite and adjacent. So in this case, if we look at this data, the opposite component is our x component. So in this case, we will use TRx, which is our 17, and divide that by our adjacent to the angle, which is our TRy, is 15 newtons. We then find that theta right is given as 17 over 15. Um, I am in radians, that kind of sucks. Or am I in degrees? I am in degrees. That's just a really stupid angle. Okay. And it turns out that the angle, this is probably why they didn't have to solve for it, comes out to be some really, really tiny angle. So one thing to note, remember that y over x is not always the case. Be sure to check your triangles and make sure that you're really thinking about who is opposite and who is adjacent to the angle that you are trying to find or the angle that you are given. The other thing to note, which I almost made this mistake, is check and make sure that you're getting an angle in degrees and not radians. On your calculator, they'll either be an R or a D somewhere on your display. Make sure that you are in degrees and not radians for your calculator. Radians are useful when we solve for omega, but all the angles we plug into our uh, trig functions are in degrees. Yes. So no, when we take the inverse tangent, what we're going to do is we're always going to assume a positive angle. The reason for this is that if you plug in negative values into your calculator for tangent inverse, you get all kinds of crazy angles. The reason for this is your calculator is always trying to calculate an angle with respect to this positive x-axis here. Let me draw this a little bit better. What this means is say if you have a vector in the third quadrant, say this vector down here, the angle your calculator will spit out for you is this angle here. You can give that angle if you want, that's perfectly allowed, but you have to make sure that you understand the angle your calculator is giving out for you. Normally, when we report angles in 7b and in physics, we don't report always from the positive axis, we instead always report from the nearest x or y axis. So ideally, the angle we actually want 
is this angle in here, which is given by just using the positive components and then noting what quadrant we are supposed to be in. So no, as long as you use the positive magnitudes and then know in what direction your magnitude or your vector is pointing, just using the absolute value of the components gets you the correct angle here. You do not need to keep the signs in the tangent. If you do, you are specifying this axis as the relative axis. And so your calculator may give you angles bigger than 90 degrees. Wet my throat a little bit. Ooh. Boy, oh boy. It is amazing my voice has lasted this long. Okay. Any other questions on this? Any other questions on torque and force? Okay. Let's do an edit to this problem then. Let's say, just for the sake of argument, that one of these ropes snaps. So in that case, just on physical intuition, what do you expect will happen to our beam? Excuse me. What happens if one of these ropes snaps, will we have a torque? If we think about where our pivot point is, if I get rid of this force entirely, are my torques balanced any longer? No. In fact, physically, you can kind of imagine that this beam will start to rotate specifically about this point here and move with the forces acting on it. So we're no longer in static equilibrium, but we do know something about the forces and torques being applied. For instance, if I have a net torque, what does that lead me to? What is that equivalent to? What does that immediately let me know is going to happen to my beam? It means there's a change to angular momentum. It means that I need to go to this problem to help starting to solve this problem above. What about there's a net force? If there's some net force, what changes in the problem? Well, there must be some change in the linear momentum. And so we can also solve these types of problems with net torques and net forces utilizing our momenta and using momenta, not conservation, but the change in momenta over time to solve for these net forces and vice versa. So the last example I want to do, will probably run a little over time, heaven forbid, you do not have to stay if you don't want to, but the last thing I'd like to cover before we go is the yo-yo problem. So the yo-yo problem I think is a really difficult, but a really good problem that emphasizes this idea of using both momentum, torque, force all together to solve a type of problem. So let's try to go over this. Um, hopefully there'll be another review on Thursday. Hopefully I'll feel well enough to do it. Um, uh, I'm on enough, you know, <laughs> medicine to, to really knock out a horse, but hopefully if I'm okay, there will be something else on Thursday as well. I will also know that I have recorded this entire session. So whether you stay or not, I will record going through this problem and post it on campus. Okay. So let's do this one last problem. So in this problem, I have a yo-yo 
that's attached to the ceiling by its string, the yo-yo is moving downward at a constant velocity. or it begins to. We start stationary, then some forces act on this yo-yo and it starts to move down with a constant velocity. So to start, we have no angular speed. And to start, we have no linear speed. We are perfectly stationary. Then after a short time, some unspecified short time later, we now have some final angular speed, some final velocity. And our goal is to figure out what forces, i.e. the tension that acts on this yo-yo in this problem. So in these two pictures, the forces that we have are, we have the force due to tension that pulls up on the yo-yo, and we also have the force of gravity that is pulling the yo-yo down and causes it to have this sort of linear acceleration. So how do we start to solve this problem? Well, it actually starts very much like the static equilibrium problem. Only this time, the sum of the forces and the sum of the torques are not zero. So let's start with torque. So if I look at the sum of all torques, what forces in this problem describe torques? Where is our pivot point in this problem? I'll note that the problem gives us a pivot point, but you don't necessarily have to use that pivot point. Either pivot point will yield the same answer. In this case, we're told to use the center of the, sorry, I think we're actually told, yes, we're told that the, not the center of the yo-yo, that's what I keep wanting to use that pivot point. We are told that the edge of the yo-yo over here will be our pivot point. So this is our pivot point. So which of our two forces gives us a torque in this scenario? Well, there's only two forces and one acts at the pivot point. So it certainly doesn't act to torque. Indeed, it is gravity. So we know that our torques, what direction is this torque in? This actually becomes very important. Now, since the torques no longer sum to zero, keeping track of our signs and making sure that we distinguish into the board and out of the board torques is very, very important. So hand at the pivot, fingers along R, and then attempting to curl them in the direction of FG, this is a torque that is into the board. So my torque due to gravity is an into the board torque. This is technically speaking a negative torque. So my sum of the torques is given as the negative of my R vector, which in this case is just R, the radius of the yo-yo times Fg. No, we do not need to pick perpendicular components here because as we already note, R points to the right, FG points down, they are already at a nice right angle. So we don't have to worry about finding perpendicular components. So that's our net torque. There is a net torque out of this problem. If there's a net torque, what must that be equal to? How does torque relate to other variables that we know in our 7B course? Well, we have a final and an initial angular velocity, so it must be angular momentum. We know that a change in angular momentum, a delta L, which is L final minus L initial, is equal to some net torque times delta T. So plugging in here, our initial angular momentum is zero. So that's nice and easy. We have no angular speed, so that is zero. We do, however, have a final angular momentum, excuse me, which is given by our omega f times the if, which we are told in this problem is one half mass 
of our yo-yo times its radius squared. And this must be equal to T net delta T. So that's our torque and angular momentum. Well, we also have forces in this case. So what we have to think about in this case, are the forces balanced? Do we have a conservation of linear momentum? In other words, when I write down my sum of the forces, is it equal to zero? Can we tell with the information given? Well, we know that in order for the forces to sum to zero, we would need to have something like the change in linear momentum. So a final minus initial would have to be zero. That's the only way that our F net would also be zero. However, if we look, we start with no linear velocity, and then at some time later, we are traveling with a constant linear velocity in the downward direction. We are traveling down. So because of that, there is a change to the linear momentum. And if there's a change to linear momentum, that indicates to us there is a net force. So there's some net force, we don't know what it is, but it would have to be equal to the sum of these other two forces, i.e. our F net must be equal to our force due to tension, which is a positive up force, minus our downward Fg, which is just the mass of the yo-yo here times G. Okay. So we have now these sets of equations. We also have the net torque up here. Sorry, is R M G. Now what in the world are we going to do with these two equations? This is where this problem is a little bit tricky. No, I said that between initial to final, there is some unspecified unknown delta T. However, the amount of time that the torque acts on our yo-yo and the amount of time that the force acts on our yo-yo, should they be the same? Did the same amount of time transpire between initial and final for both our torque and our force? Well, yeah, right? We only have one initial and one final, so delta T is the same. What we'll do then is we'll rearrange each of these two equations for delta T and set those equal to each other. What this looks like is the following. We get delta T is equal to, note our initial linear momentum is zero, and our final is going to be the mass of the yo-yo times its final velocity. So that must be then equal to delta T is M V final divided by our F net, which is F tension minus Mg. But this also must be equal to our angular problem of P. Our delta T is omega final times one half mR squared divided by our torque net, which in this case is just R M G. Note, we need to carry a negative over here. I know this sounds really, really bizarre. It's pertinent because we are making sure to note that this omega does not have the same sign or direction as the torque being applied. Or we're not assuming the sign of omega final, and so we need to keep the sign hanging around from the original torque. So we've set both equations equal to each other from delta t. So now let's just try to cancel and see what we can get out of this. So we can cancel an m from both sides, but that's pretty much it. So we're a little stuck. What we're trying to find is this f tension. Everything else we more or less know. So we need to somehow get rid of these final velocities, both angular and linear. 
The way we do this is that there's another piece of information we are given. Basically, we are told that the yo-yo slides or rolls across this rope without slipping. This implies that the velocity of the center of mass, the center of mass, and the velocity of this point here next to the rope are exactly equal and opposite in the final picture down here. This means if this is some V tangential up here, we know that the tangential velocity is related to the angular velocity by the R vector, the distance between those two points. So now that we have this, we now know that V final is equal to omega final times R. Plugging that in here, we get R omega final times R FT minus MG is equal to omega final one half R squared minus, oh, we should also cancel an R and an R from here and here. So I'll get rid of that minus mg, this is just an r up here. We can cancel now on omega and an r, an omega and an r. And what we are left with, flipping these to the opposite sides, we get ft minus mg is equal to twice minus m, sorry, negative two mg. We can then move this to the other side and we get the force due to the tension is equal to two mg plus mg. I think I messed up a sign somewhere. Those are supposed to add. I, maybe I was not supposed to take this negative sign over. So I'm gonna apologize really quickly. There is a sign error here. This is why it's important to be very specific in exactly what you are trying to do. So we will not carry this negative sign through. That was a mistake on my part. We'll sort of keep that negative sign out. If we do that, this negative sign down here disappears. And when we move this over, instead of a negative two mg, we just get two mg. To that two mg, we will add an mg. All right. So. Our final answer is here. I'm gonna erase our final picture over here since we no longer need it, is that the force due to the tension in that rope is equal to three times the mass of the yo-yo times G. Plugging in, we get three times the mass, which is given as 0 0.4 kilograms times G, which is 10 meters per second squared. Then plugging all of that in, we get three times 0 0.4 times 10 is not exactly there, but that is okay. We get fairly close, Ft is 12 newtons. Okay. And with that, we are done. So, Again, the final number here is not the big takeaway. The real big takeaway here in this case is this idea of being able to use momentum, torque, momentum, and force in order to solve problems where the momentum isn't necessarily conserved. When we have impulses, linear or angular impulses, it's entirely possible to still solve by finding things like the net force, finding things like the net torque, and using those to calculate impulses and using those impulses to solve for other types of variables. So this is an excellent problem. I very much recommend trying to practice this problem on your own. As you can see, it's not an easy problem. My uh, disease-addled brain hasn't quite exactly gotten this right, but the setup here is mainly correct. So if you have other questions, let me know. I will note that this isn't exactly correct. I've made some sort of calculational error in here somewhere that I don't know where it is and I don't have a mental capacity to find out. So this I think is a really hard problem. I would not expect this on your quiz. 
But I think this is a really good problem if you want to try to be, want to say you have mastered this idea of momentum, force, and impulse, or momentum, torque, and angular impulse. This is a great problem to really shore up those techniques. Okay. With that, I'm going to go ahead and end the recording here. So thanks for joining me, those of you who are joining sort of asynchronously. Um, if you have any questions, please let me know, email, message me. Um, I will have other um, office hours on Thursday, hopefully as long as I am feeling up to it. All right, so I'll end the recording and then